Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, second day of our conference. Um, if I may start, Natalie, with a very brief warning uh, about the weather. Obviously, you've all, you've all noticed the, the hot weather. It's going to be very hot today. Uh, for the first time, apparently, in, 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 in the history of this region, the authorities have, have uh, declared what they call a red alert. So, so feel free to use your, your water bottles, of course, as, as often as possible. Um, and um, another um, specificity to this morning's session is the fact that we have, I might actually uh, give them to you now, uh, Natalie, it's an English translation of our third paper today, the one by Patrick, who's going to be delivered in French. So for those of you who don't understand French or couldn't follow easily, we have a few copies of the uh, English text, it's, which is also available via the uh, QR code that uh, Leslie mentioned yesterday. So please tell Natalie if you need a, an, English, an English copy. Okay, so this, this, this morning's session, as you know, is, is devoted to the shorter text of uh, Stevenson. And just a few words on... on Right, so when Natalie, and Leslie and Julie asked me to chair the panel on the shorter text, I wasn't sure I would be up to it at such short notice. But then I reread or read for the first time some of Stevenson's short stories and instantly felt I wanted to know more about them. Intriguing, entertaining, frightening, unlike anything I'd ever read, the stories certainly gave me pleasure. Not the pleasure maybe you get from the sublime beauty of Shakespeare or Conrad, not the guilty, easy pleasure you get from relaxing with a comic book or a fashionable bestseller, but the pleasure to be led by a truly unique voice on a wild journey through a literary landscape unlike any other. A landscape which is the exact opposite of the straight road and flat fields that Richard Dury so aptly conjured up yesterday when he defined what makes Stevenson's text so charming and pleasurable. And to explore the specificity of the shorter text, I will now introduce our three distinguished speakers. We will start with Burkhard Niederhof, who is already ready there at the table, who is a professor of English literature at Ruhr Universität Bochum in Germany and specializes beyond Stevenson in narrative theory and the history and theory of comedy. He's recently published an anthology on 20th century comedy, which tackles such varied genres as TV sitcom, comic books, and dramatic comedy, and two articles on Stevenson, one on the explanatory notes in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, written with Lena Linner, and one on the exotic other and the other within a comparative reading of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Mystery of Clumber and Stevenson's The Pavilion of the Lynx. Our second speaker, Lena Lina is also from Ruhr Universität Bochum and is a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at the Chair of English Literature. Her PhD thesis, Unlived Lives in English Literature, a Typological Study, was published in 2019. It combines narratology and the study of motifs, and it focuses on a wide range of authors, among them Henry James, Virginia Woolf, and Alice Munro. Lena assists Burkhard Niederhof in editing a volume of early short stories by Stevenson as part of the new Edinburgh edition of his works. And finally, before a brief question time and a coffee break at 10.30, we'll be hearing Patrick Antoniol, who is a recently retired scholar from the north of France. He wrote his PhD at Lille University on the French novelist Alain Fournier and spent most of his career teaching French language and literature in a high school in the town of avennes sur elbe his current pleasures include gardening, beekeeping, and attending the Maroual Historical Society. Maroual, in addition to being close to the canal where Stevenson traveled in 1876, as we uh, heard yesterday, is famous for its eponymous pungent cheeses. So, Bocat, the floor is yours, okay, if you want to start. Thank you, um, thank you, Antoine. Uh, can you all hear me? Oh, okay. And good morning uh, to all of you, and thanks again to our three organizers, Leslie, Nathalie, and Julie, for hanging on and making this happen here in Bordeaux. My talk has uh, two sources of inspiration. Uh, the first is a long-standing interest in Stevenson's aestheticism. This aestheticism is most strongly expressed in his early essays, such as Rhodes, An Autumn Impression, or Ordered South, 
about which we uh, heard yesterday from Kevin Christin. Um, and in these essays, uh, Stevenson echoes Walter Pater's plea for keeping our senses wide open, for seizing and relishing each moment with its particular constellation of sensory qualities um, as it uh, passes by. And he also anticipates Oscar Wilde's paradoxes about life imitating art and Oscar Wilde's technique of presenting reality in terms of paintings or dramatic scenes, etc. Now, it, it could be argued, and actually it was argued last night by Robert Louis Abramson, who gave about two minutes of my talk without knowing it <laughs> um, at, the, at the Mairie, that Stevenson leaves this asceticism behind around 1880 and turns towards a more ethical, morally responsible uh, stance, which may have something to do with the fact that he got married and that he acquired uh, a wife and two children uh, to support um, there, is a, there is a note that he appended to Ordered South, which was written in the early uh, 70s, and then when he republished it in Virginibus Porisque, uh, in this note he explicitly distances himself from this note, and he introduces a new vocabulary of regrets and obligations and duties that is entirely absent from this er early essay. Now, I'm not entirely persuaded that aestheticism is dead in Stevenson after 1880. He doesn't leave it behind completely. In 1886, he writes in an essay um, on Dr. Jekyll and Mitha, uh, Mr. Hyde, ethics are my veiled mistress. But I think this phrase, my veiled mistress, applies equally to aesthetics uh, in the case of Stevenson. I, I see him torn between these two mistresses, e ethics and aesthetics, throughout his career. Th there is a painting uh, by Sir Joshua Reynolds of David Garrick, um, which some of you may know, where, where the famous 18th century actor is shown between two women who represent the two genres of tragedy and comedy. So Dav David Garrick sort of uh, being appealed to by these two different dramatic genres. And uh, this is how I perceive Stevenson between his two veiled mistresses of ethics and aesthetics. Today, the emphasis will be on aesthetics. Now, so that's the first source of inspiration. The second is uh, my work as an uh, editor of Stevenson's early uh, short story stories, and in particular, the annotation of um, Providence and the guitar, the story I will be talking about. And I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of quotes and allusions in the story um, and, the, and the amount of time I had to spend researching and uh, writing them. And I thought um, when the call for paper, uh, papers arrived for this conference an unconscionable time ago that I could make an, um, a connection between the uh, intertextual uh, dimension of that story and Stevenson's aestheticism. So here's the outline of my talk, which follows from these two uh, considerations. Um, uh, first, the introduction, and we've almost, we've almost accomplished that. Um, I will give a brief introduction to the story. I'm not assuming uh, that you've all read it or that you all remember it very uh, well. Then I will talk about the aestheticism uh, of the story uh, in connection with its protagonist, Léon Bertellini. And finally, I will talk about its intertextuality in connection with the aestheticism. So, Providence and the Guitar was first published in 1878 in London and then republished in 1882 in the second volume of New Arabian Nights. The setting is a French provincial town in the mid-1870s, so it's a, it's a contemporary story, contemporary with the writing and the publication uh, by the name of Castel Le Gachy. The principal, that's a sort of a semi-telling uh, name. Um, uh, the principal characters are Léon Bertellini, who wanted to be a great actor on the London stage, but failed, uh, wasn't successful and has now uh, to make a living touring the provinces and strumming a guitar. And this is accompanied and supported by his wife, Elvira. 
Uh, at Castel Lugashi, they meet Stubbs, who is a Cambridge undergraduate on a walking tour and who wants to be a banker. So, sort of an opposite character to the two of them. Then, at the end of the story, they meet a French painter and his wife, so another artist or failed artist, as we will see. And finally, there are various uh, inhabitants of Castel de Gachy, the most prominent of which is probably a very high-handed commissary, <coughs> unlike the very nice French gentleman who we experienced at the Mairie last night. The plot, um, it could be called the second Sedan. This is a phrase uh, from that comes from Léon, the day doesn't start well when he walks into the inn to check in. Uh, the landlord is extremely unfriendly and Léon thinks, oh, th this day is not going to end well, it will be a second sedan. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, of course, the defeat of the French by the Prussians in the recent Franco-Prussian War. So, in the evening, Léon and his wife perform at the café of the Triumphs of the Plough, the audience is not very responsive, especially when it comes to the collection of money. Um, then they are rudely interrupted by this commissary who points out to them that they haven't got a license signed by him, which is legalistically, technically true, but extremely unfair. Then they are locked out of their hotel and the landlord refuses to open his doors. Um, they have to stay outdoors and that's where they meet this uh, English undergraduate by the name of Stubbs, and then the three of them see uh, a light in a house, uh, and they walk up to this house and play a piece of music, and then they are welcomed and invited in, uh, and given shelter by a French painter and his wife. And these two just have had a major row, a major um, argument <coughs> about the clerkship that the painter has been offered. And the wife wants him to accept uh, uh, this, this clerkship and make, some, make a decent salary, but he wants to paint. He, he doesn't want to, uh, to work. And so, so they're very similar in a way to uh, Leon and his wife. We have two artists who are just as devoted uh, to their art as they are incapable. Um, and their wives are, not wives are not too happy with that, but Leon and Elvira manage to reconcile uh, this painter to his wife at the end of the story, so it's not quite a second uh, sedan. Okay, part three, uh, aestheticism, and especially uh, Leon Bertellini's, the protagonist's aestheticism. When the painter and his wife present their disagreement um, to the three uh, visitors. Leon takes the, wi the side of the painter. He says, art is art, swept in Leon. I salute art. It is the beautiful, the divine. It is the spirit of the world and the pride of life. And Leon pr practices what he preaches he transforms his own um, not too glamorous life into a work of art, really like Lord Henry or Dorian Gray in Oscar Wilde's eponymous uh, novel. And here's an example of that. When he, this is Leon, when he wore an overcoat, he scorned to pass the sleeves. A single button held it round his shoulders. It was tossed backwards after the manner of a cloak and carried with the gait and presence of an alma viva. I am of opinion that Monsieur Bertellini was nearing 40, but he had a boy's heart, gloried in his finery, and walked through life like a child in a perpetual dramatic performance. So I've highlighted the phrases here that indicate the aesthetic self-fashioning uh, in terms of acting and the, the theater. Alma Viva is a character in three plays by Beaumarchais, uh, the most famous of which is Le Mariage de Figaro, of course also turned into a famous opera, where Alma Viva is an overbearing and flamboyant aristocrat. And there, there are many quotations of this uh, sort, which I could pile up to fill the rest of my uh, time here, but I will give you only 
one more. And this is from the description of Léon's argument with the commissary. And Léon really here is on the losing side. The commissary uh, imposes his will on him because he has the power uh, to do so. But Léon imposes his will on the commissary as far as the manner of the argument is concerned. He's still, turn he's still successful in turning it into a dramatic performance and makes the commissary play along. Léon recognized that he was in a hole, but his spirit rose with the occasion and he blustered nobly, tossing back his curls. The commissary played up to him in the character of a tyrant, and as the one leaned further forward, the other leaned farther back, majesty confronting fury. The audience had transferred their attention to this new performance and listened with that silent gravity common to all Frenchmen in the presence of the police. There was nothing for it but to obey. Léon did so with a proper pantomime of indifference, but it was a leak to eat and there was no denying it. Now I've compared uh, uh, Providence and the Guitar with Dorian Gray, but this quote uh, shows that there are also some difference. Leon is not a Dorian Gray or uh, Lord Henry. They have different uh, personality and are placed in different circumstances. Uh, Lord Henry doesn't have to sing uh, for a living and he doesn't have to argue with petty uh, officials. And in person, Léon is really the opposite of the Alma Viva role that he likes uh, to play. In person, he was decidedly small and inclined to be stout. If he had worn the clothes of the period, you would have set him down for a hitherto undiscovered hybrid between the barber, the innkeeper, and the affable dispensing chemist. Um, so, if you if you like a, a, a hybrid between a barber and innkeeper and then dispensing chemist, you're really like a quintessential bourgeois, which is the exact opposite of the Alma Viva role that um, Leon likes to play. So there's a comic clash between person and persona, between reality and role here, but this is not degrading or deflating. The narrator, who is very prominent here in this day, is a third person narrator, but he's very prominent, expresses his sympathy and his regret, uh, and not his regret, his respect, uh, maybe also his regret, uh, his respect repeatedly for, um, for Leon. I've seen him at moments when he has fancied himself alone with his maker, adopt so gay and chivalrous a bearing and represent his own part with so much warmth and conscience that the illusion became catching and I believed implicitly in the great creature's pose. Um, interestingly, Léon is also acting when he's alone. You, you don't act to God. Um, even so Léon uh, uh, acts even wha when there is no audience present. So he's not a vain and affected poseur, but rather an amiable humorist, like Uncle Toby and Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy. We smile at him, but we also sympathize with him at the same time. Now, part four, intertextuality. Uh, Léon uses quotation and delusion as part of his aesthetic self-fashioning. Uh, when he plays a role, he announces it through these intertextual references. For instance, when Elvira and he are alone, locked out of their hotel, and it seems that they will have uh, to spend the night out of doors, um, he, uh, his response is as follows. This is his speech addressed to Elvira to cheer up. Um, this is the poetry of life. Think of, and I've highlighted the allusions and quotations here. Think of Cooper's novels, my dear. Come now, let us repeat a scene. Shall we try Alceste and Selimen? No. Or a passage from The Two Orphans? Come now, it will occupy your mind. I will play up to you as I've never played before. I feel art moving in my bones. 
« Dites la jeune belle, où voulez-vous aller? » He caroled. Um, so all of this comes within 15 lines or so. I've left out a, a few bits, but it comes in very, very uh, rapid uh, succession. Um, and it's certainly excessive. It's excessive in quantitative terms, you know, these four uh, illusions in rapid succession. That's typical of the story as a whole. It's also excessive in qualitative terms. The illusions do not really fit. Um, usually when we interpret literary illusions of great, uh, great writers, uh, we try to point out how nicely the illusion fits into the context, including the context of the quotation and its implications and so on. Here the illusions do not fit, and uh, that, is, uh, that is the point. They are excessive. <coughs> Um, for instance, Léon is not like Alceste in Molière's uh, Misanthrope. He's not a misanthrope at all. Um, and the other, the other dramatic allusions here to the two orphans is to a recent melodrama first performed in 1874, which is about two young sisters who are orphans and who have recently arrived from the provinces. They are stranded in Paris and they end up in the clutches of criminals and evil aristocrats. So th that is too far in the other extreme, in the extreme of uh, misery. Um, it's not a pleasant situation for Leon and Elvira, but it's not quite as bad as that of the two orphans. So the, there's something excessive in these quotations as there is in Leon and the, the contrast between Leon's role and the, the reality of his uh, character. So I maintained early on, and this is really my final point now, <laughs> uh, that the narrator uh, expresses his sympathy and understanding uh, for Léon. He doesn't degrade or deflate him. Um, and this is also shown by uh, how the narrator imitates uh, the way in which Léon uh, quotes and alludes by sharing in this intertextual excess of Léon. And I will give you one example, uh, just one example of that, which is my favorite uh, quotation here in this uh, story. And um, this is uh, the encounter uh, with the young English uh, student where this young man, this is the student, says, who is woken up by Léon, and says, who are you? And Léon answers with a quotation, under which King Bisonian claimed the artist speak or die. Or if it wasn't exactly that, it was something to much the same purpose from a French tragedy. And I'll shorten this a little bit. The quotation is from the second part of Henry uh, IV, Act 5.3, in which Pistol has come to inform Falstaff that Henry the Fourth has died, uh, Prince Hal is now king, and they expect Falstaff to be accepted at at court. So basically, the the context here is we have a new uh, king, and this is the form in which in Henry uh, the Fourth, Pistol finally, after much comic delay, manages to deliver to deliver his message, and. The quotation in itself here doesn't make sense at all. It's, it's not a proper response to, hello, who are you? And, and that's the point. So the quotation doesn't fit. What fits is the speaker. A uh, pistol in Shakespeare's play is a grandiloquent character who speaks a heroic and inflated language, which is always in excess of the oc uh, occasion. And thus he's not unlike Léon. And the narrator here introduces that English quotation as a way of colluding uh, with uh, Léon, as a way of imitating his manner. And he translates this sort of imaginary original French uh, translation into an English uh, equivalent. And here I will stop in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you.